Hello and welcome to Engineering Experience by Paragon Innovations. I'm your host today, Tyler Kern, alongside Mike Wilkinson. Mike, good to talk to you today. Good to see you. Always good to, uh, to sit next to a, a friend here. And today we have a fantastic guest. His name is Dr. Philip Purdy. He's the co-founder and CMO of Endifis Holdings. LLC and also the former vice chair of clinical operations at the Department of Radiology at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Dr. Purdy, thank you so much for joining us. Today. Happy to be here. So I could run down a, uh, a two or three paragraph bio of all the things that you've done in your career, which is uh, extensive and you've done a lot of amazing things. But why don't you just tell me a little bit more about your role and what you do at Endifis Holdings and uh, a little bit more about some of the things that you've achieved there. The company was started uh, based on some work that I did while I was on the faculty at UT Southwestern. Um, I was trained as an interventional neuroradiologist. It's a, somebody who uses catheters to do things in the brain the way that cardiologists use catheters to do things in the heart. And in the course of doing procedures on patients, I felt that there was a, a problem in the way that we monitor blood pressure during procedures because uh, that technology hasn't changed f since before I was in medical school in the 1970s and and it's analog technology and basically just gives you a waveform and the patient care monitor uh, derives the pressures from that waveform and I felt that technology for pressure monitoring had advanced to a point where we should be able to do better than that in, in medicine and so um, I started down a road of trying to figure out how to do better measuring of blood pressure during procedures and decided on uh, this fiber optic pressure sensor technology. Uh, the particular sensors that we use uh, take individual discrete digital pressure measurements from 500 to 1,000 times a second uh, down to one or two tenths of a millimeter mercury. So it's much more robust and the fact that it's digital and gives discrete individual measurements uh, uh, enables the possibility of doing statistical analysis and much more mathematical treatment of that data than you can do off of an analog waveform. That's really, really interesting and incredibly fascinating that you saw an opportunity and said, you know what, we can do this better, and you went out and did it. So you hold 24 international patents, including several for the Indifis pressure sensing access system. So tell me about your journey between doctor and innovator um, and a little bit more about that process and you know what occurred for you to come to the realization that these solutions were needed in this industry. Well, I was very lucky, uh, honestly. Uh, in the late 1980s, when I uh, was early in my uh, time at, at, out of training, and um, uh, we were, there was a technology that was developed for using catheters to treat cerebral aneurysms, um, and those are called coils. They're made of platinum and they are, you put a catheter inside the aneurysm from placement in the leg uh, and you run it up into the brain and put it inside the aneurysm and um, uh, introduce these platinum coils to fill that aneurysm. And it uh, was a treatment that supplanted um, neurosurgical operation, removing part of the skull and, and doing it direct open surgery. I um, developed or had some ideas about configurations for coils. And um, uh, I was training uh, uh, somebody. I'd started a program for training interventional neuroradiologists at UT Southwestern. And I was training somebody and, and talking to him about this idea and said, you know, I really need a patent attorney, but I don't even know how to find one. And he said, well, my brother's a patent lawyer. Uh, <laughs> As and, it turns out. And, and, and so uh, he put me in touch with his brother. And the first five patents that I ever filed were patents related to cerebral aneurysms mm -hmm. and cerebral aneurysm coils. Um, and um, uh, long story, but I, I'll try to shorten it for you. Uh, I was I wound up speaking with a company after those patents were issued, speaking with a company called Cordis, 
that about those aneurysm coils and uh, they were going to license my patents and then in the middle of that process they got bought by Johnson & Johnson and then so that took 18 months out of the calendar to do all that and then Johnson & Johnson wanted to continue on with those patent licenses and so they licensed those patents um, and then over another three or four years the, these things play out in decades I mean it, it was it was that we were the patents were filed in 1992, and it was um, in the mid 2000s when Johnson Johnson actually started selling coils. Um, and but that gave me a royalty stream through UT Southwestern that gave me some access to funds in an account at the university, and then that as it started growing, I thought, you know, I need to do something with this money because I could either just spend my career traveling and on, on you know, it was, it was university money so I could, I'd going to meetings and that kind of thing, or I could try to do something. And, and I decided to try to figure out to do something. And, and so then that was another three years or so settling on um, what to do with several animal experiments and several um, investigations of different types of approaches and um, I had been doing a um, technique in the spinal cord uh, to cool the spinal cord in the case of spinal cord injury and navigating the subarachnoid space which is a space in the sp around the spine and the brain that contains cerebral spinal fluid mm -hmm. uh, and um, needed to monitor pressure in the brain and spinal cord as I was infusing this fluid and decided to come up with this technique for monitoring the pressure around the spinal cord and then I had a, a moment in that process somewhere where you know we don't do blood pressure monitoring that well even mm -hmm. and there's a much larger market in blood pressure uh, so um, that's what kind of launched me and that was around 2007 or so. Right. Um, then I started, uh, I hired an engineer in Minneapolis. And we hired a company in Minneapolis that made catheters and um, uh, then we made trips to several places to identify the pressure sensor technology we wanted to use and um, settled on a company in, um, in the United States that, that we were working with and um, uh, we got to the place where we were we knew the technology platform we were going to use and then we had to figure out how to um, make it something that could be used in patients and that was a that turned into a medical electronic device project and um, I, I had already hired an electrical engineer in Dallas to help me with that aspect of it, and he had familiarity with Paragon, uh, and and so he got me and the people at it's called the Technology Transfer Office at UT Southwestern mm -hmm. in touch with uh, uh, Paragon and Mike, and um, um, that's how it started. So Mike, when you first heard about what Dr. Purdy was doing, what were your first impressions and, and what did you think? Well, that was really cool. I mean, I love that we love medical devices and this is just another medical device that, um, that sounded really cool. He had already done all the homework on how to, what technology to use this, in this optical fiber. And uh, so we were really excited to get to work with Dr. Purdy and, and, and make a product that he could go to market with. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Purdy, when it came to choosing a technology partner, you kind of talked about how you, you know, the, the journey by which you came to meet Mike and, and know Paragon, but what made them the right choice for you? Doing a startup, and, and this was sort of a startup that was being done inside the auspices of the university. Uh, doing a startup is a very, frustrating and difficult uh, experience <laughs> and um, uh, and uh, I had we had problems related to the optical company that we were using that they they didn't address some problems um, and um, uh, the lo the 
proximity to Paragon was um, uh, real attractive, mm -hmm. and also the I we went to several medical device companies around, um, and and Paragon seemed at least as robust as any of them, and and more robust in the sense of being able to partner and work with them locally, right. and so um, uh, that was the most. Uh, very attractive, and it turned out they were also real competent. <laughs> so that was, I mean, that was a real. Place. We fooled them good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, from from your perspective, Mike, what makes an ideal partner uh, when it comes to partnering together with you know with a company like what Dr. Purdy does? What makes an ideal partner when it comes to communication or working together? What, how does that partnership really come together and work well? Well, I think it works well when um, there is a lot of communication. That's the most important thing between uh, partners. Um, in this case, we've got an expert in the technology and the medicine side. Mm -hmm. That's not our expertise. We, we're not doctors. Um, we went to school far less. <laughs> and, um, and so they bring to the party exactly what the product needs to do, why it needs to do what it needs to do, and then basically we're the, we're the chefs in the kitchen that can take what needs to be done and then build that, that device to perform that function. Um, and so uh, working with Dr. Pretty was great because he, he knows all that. He's been, you know, been in the business for a very long time and as a right. doctor, and then for us to just make the device was uh, more straightforward. Mm. So, Dr. Purdy, you know, um, what are the future plans for the Indifis pressure sensing access system? So, what do you, what do you see happening in the future, and maybe what excites you about that? Well, so uh, to to do that, I have to really kind of talk a little bit about how things are done now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, blood pressure monitoring since at least the 1960s has, as I said earlier, been an analog technology. Um, and um, this technology predated the invention of the p personal computer. Uh, it predated all of the, the huge you know, Silicon Valley experience that we've seen over the past several decades. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, in the lab at UT Southwestern, um, before I was ever in touch with Paragon, I was experimenting with trying to figure out how to use these technologies. And there was a whole catheter d design piece of this that, that was separate from the electronics. But for instance, um, in, in lab experiments with uh, a flow device that I created, um, uh, giving pressure waveforms, um, I, I saw that what looked like this on a waveform on a patient care monitor, which was the standard for monitoring in medicine, mm -hmm. looks like this when you start actually breaking it down to, to the, uh, with the kind of fidelity that you can get off of these sensors. And uh, I, I, the thing that it, it was, a, it's a kind of a silly thing, but it's a telling thing. Um, uh, I took two pieces of tubing, one of them made of silicone and one of them made of latex. They had exactly the same wall thickness. They had exactly the same diameter on the inside of them. And I put sensors in each of those pieces of tubing and collected some data off of them and looked at the waveforms. And you can't really tell them apart to look at them, but the company that I acquired, the, the it was really a scientific company uh, that I acquired the, the, the means to do that with, mm -hmm. had software and it allowed to do mathematical treatment of those that wave, that numbers system. And, and I did a, there's a process in math called Fourier transformation that, that I'm no mathematician, but I, I was familiar with it because it's used in reconstructing images from CT scanners in medicine. And, and so I, I was able to do a Fourier transformation on those waveforms. And when you look at the slopes that are created by that mathematical process, I could tell which I could tell silicon from latex. Wow! Um, and so I, I'm looking at that and, and thought, hmm, I could probably tell atherosclerosis from not atherosclerosis. And there's no telling what else I might be able to tell. Like I said, I'm no mathematician. If it ever got into the hands of a mathematician, 
what they might be able to do with data of that kind of fidelity. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, the end game for me is that, uh, to be able to do that with this technology. Not there yet uh, because, you know, there have been a lot of bumps. I mean, uh, doing a medical device startup is a lot more frustrating than I ever thought it would be. But, but, but that's what this is about, is getting to the point where we can look at that kind of data. And there are questions that are very difficult to answer with the um, um, analog device and very simple to answer if we have this sensor because what happens in, in measuring pressures is uh, that you have to have a fluid, direct continuous fluid channel mm -hmm. from the place you want to measure out to the device that hangs on an IV pole and that's where the chip is that does that analog pressure monitor, um, monitoring. And um, if you are in a setting where you have a catheter in a position, you want to measure a pressure through that catheter, then you want to do some manipulation through that catheter, and then you want to measure another pressure through that catheter. You have to put in a guide wire, direct the catheter to where you want it to be, take the guide wire out, hook it up to the transducer, make your measurement off of that transducer, then do whatever you want to do through that catheter, which may involve moving it again, right. um, and then rehook it up and do all that all over again. And it is very time consuming. Mm -hmm. And there are situations in, um, like when they want a, a patient who has renal failure and is has a shunt in their arm that goes from an artery to a vein, and that starts to block up and they want to go in there and do a procedure to open it up. They have to measure the pressure and see the pressure on one side and on the other side of that shunt. Then they have to uh, go do their manipulation with an angioplasty balloon or whatever. Then they have to go back in and make more measurements on either side of the shunt. If you've got a catheter with a sensor in it, you're just making those measurements continuously a thousand times a second as you're doing those procedures. And you can, and so the time of the procedure uh, is cut a lot and risks of procedures are related to how long they take mm -hmm. uh, and so you can conceivably cut the risk. Um, similarly what has happened since our company started um, I, I left UT Southwestern in 2014. There's a, a private equity firm in downtown Dallas that agreed to acquire that technology and develop it, but I had to come with it. And mm -hmm. so I left the university and went with this firm uh, here. And um, what, what um, uh, then had to happen was we, we spent a lot of time developing the, the tools um, to, to do that. And during that transition time, um, medicine changed. Uh, my area of medicine changed. It used to be that the big area that interventional neuroradiology did was cerebral aneurysms. But in the meantime, uh, they developed a way to treat stroke that involved putting a catheter up in the brain wow. and putting a device into the blood clot that was in the brain and then pulling the blood clot out uh, and and opening it back up and it transformed stroke therapy. I mean, it's it has revolutionized stroke therapy, and um, uh, it turns out that time is very important. Uh, and so, if if you're going to do a procedure that's going to take 45 minutes, your outcome is going to be much worse than if you're doing a procedure that takes 10 minutes. Mm. Uh, but it also turns out that monitoring patients' blood pressure is important when they're having a stroke. And with our device, which is a sheath, it's a, it's, it's a, a device, a, cath a short catheter that's put in an artery and then all the procedure is done through that catheter. And my basic catheter technology was I developed a means to embed our sensor into the plastic wall of that sheath so that you can monitor patients' blood pressure continuously 
while you're doing other procedures through that sheath, whatever you want to do, but you know what their blood pressure is. And so um, the, the prior technology used that transducer on an IV pole, you had to put a separate catheter into the artery in the wrist uh, and hook it up to that transducer and just getting that catheter put into that wrist and putting it on IV, hooking it up to the IV pole takes anywhere from uh, real fast would be five or 10 minutes. Uh, not unusual is 30 minutes, could be 45 minutes or an hour. And so um, with our sheath, you have instantaneous blood pressure monitoring because you're gonna put a sheath in whether it's got a sensor in it or not. And so um, this has turned out to be something that makes stroke therapy much more robust. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, it's been real rewarding, uh, but um, there are a lot of frustrations when you translate from being able to do something in the lab to getting hospitals to pay you for it. Right, uh, right. And those are some of the, what we've been going through. So when you talk about you know saving lives and, and putting devices in patients and, and that sort of thing, it's, it's obviously important that these devices are consistently you know engineered with the utmost precision and with the utmost um, care taken to ensure that every product is is functioning and is correct. So you know uh, how do consistent engineering processes lead to excellent results when it comes to your products? It's very important that um, uh, the engineering people you're working with know medical device technology and also know medical device regulatory requirements. I mean, our, uh, the, we, we call our, the, the device that uh, Paragon helped us develop is, we call it our blood pressure monitor. It's the electronic box that hangs on an IV pole that, get, that reads out the pressure and also communicates to a patient care monitor. And uh, so, to shorten it, we call it the BPM. Uh, our BPM, um, has to meet uh, the regulatory standards, and that includes um, uh, electronic insulation, uh, what they call means of patient protection, that, that if there's an uh, electrical shock to the patient, it can't get, or, or to, in the box, it can't get out to the patient, or if there's an electrical shock off of some other device connected to the patient, this, our box can't be a conduit to, um, to transmit it to the patient, it has to be able to withstand temperature variations and, and uh, yeah, it has to be able to not, uh, there's a test where they put it on a, a turnstile, like an old a phonograph turnstile, and they have dripping water on it and it can't have water get into the box during, I mean, there's, there's a whole long list of regulatory requirements with electronic medical devices and you've got to be working with a company that knows that sure. or if you don't design it into your box you get to start over and it was between our first box and our second box that we started and found Paragon because mm -hmm. the first box we didn't have that in all of that and so uh, it came out in a form of that was really stripped down right. and because Paragon was um, familiar with it and knew how to do it and could do it. Um, the second box was much more robust and we're working with them on the third box now, which will be even further more robust. So Mike, from your perspective, how do you ensure that everything that you do is of the utmost quality? What kind of uh, quality checks do you do and, and, and that sort of thing? <clears throat> so there are requirements for the FDA. Um, there's ISO 1345, which is uh, design and manufacturing requirements. There's also uh, in the Code of Federal Regulations 21 CFR 820, which is required. And to do all that, we basically have to get trained. So our guys are uh, constantly going to uh, uh, training events, both online and in person, uh, to keep up to date. Uh, we also use an outside regulatory uh, consultant uh, to make sure that we're up to date on all the new requirements, uh, which are changing and uh, for medical device. And then just by doing it a lot with a lot of different customers, it keeps us up to date on everything we're doing so that all of our medical customers get that um, quality that they um, need and required. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So, Dr. Purdy, you know, you, you mentioned that you're working on Third Box now with uh, with Paragon. Uh, it, talk to me a little bit more about how you see Endifice in the wider medical market, and you know, what's the future of your business, and how does Paragon play a part in that? Well, this is all related to um, my, at the end of the day, my learning curve. Uh, that the you know what we did with our uh, blood pressure monitor box was um, add uh, a USB port on the second box mm -hmm. and add a patient monitor interface on the second box. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the patient monitor interface then connects directly to a patient care monitor and um, the patient care monitor thinks it's looking at one of those Wheatstone bridge transducers because patient care monitors have been designed and built around the Wheatstone Bridge transducer. Mm -hmm. That's that's the analog thing that hangs on an IP pole. Um, and so um, we have gotten to the place with that one now where we can talk to the patient care monitor and that gives our data access to the patient medical record, the electronic medical record. And so that was a real plus. The USB port um, has the ability to collect the, that data and to do mathematical analysis with it, uh, statistical analysis. That's something we haven't done yet, mm -hmm. um, but so that's on the horizon. Um, and um, uh, the uh, one of the regulatory issues that we have to solve with this version uh, is getting away from um, is getting to be able to use it in a, the broader hospital environment. Right now, we're kind of restricted to the cath lab environment, and and uh, some of that is related to regulations that are in a cath lab are different from regulations that are in an intensive care unit, in an emergency room, et cetera, et cetera. And we're trying to be more generally applicable across the patient care uh, experience in a hospital because patients move from place to place inside a hospital. They come in the emergency room, they're hooked up to a patient care monitor, but that patient care monitor is bolted into the wall in the emergency room. Right. So then they go over to the cath lab and they get hooked up to a different patient care monitor, which is bolted onto a stand in the, in the cath lab. And then after the procedure, they go up to the intensive care unit and there's yet another patient care monitor, not counting the one that they're hooked up to to be transported from the cath lab to the, to the patient, to the, um, uh, ICU and so so there are a lot of changeover uh, experiences that this goes this technology goes through um, as a patient is transported around in a hospital and um, each time you connect to a patient care monitor you have to um, what they call zero the monitor in other words the, the monitor the patient care monitor has to observe what atmospheric pressure is and then based on that atmospheric pressure, you know how high the systolic or the diastolic pressure is because it's that many millimeters of mercury above the atmospheric pressure. Right. When our sheath is put into a patient, it doesn't come out. Uh, so there's not currently a way to zero, to re-zero to a new patient care monitor, et cetera. And so that's one of the things that we're gonna put in this so that it, you know, it'll become a more generalizable hospital experience. Uh, for that device. That's fantastic. Well, this sounds like a fantastic partnership that helps people and is very beneficial. It has to be very rewarding for the two of you to work on. And so It is, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been a pleasure getting a chance to learn a little bit more about that today, Dr. Purdy. So thank you so much for joining us here on Engineering Experience. Yeah.